there you are. All right, so first of all, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am so excited to be here today with you. We are developers, you guys are doing a fantastic job. We are partnering on this for a number of years now and uh, I couldn't be happier to uh, join this audience because I know you have the best audience in the world. Uh, and doing this virtually from home, as you can see in my background here, uh, is a lot of fun. I'm also incredibly happy to have Isabel, uh, who also I know for a couple of years now. Um, and so we are gonna talk about uh, the importance of understanding uh, why mindset is key in order to participate fully in the development of artificial intelligence. We uh, prepared a couple of real life examples. Uh, so I'm gonna take the next probably 15 minutes to give you my point of view, uh, particularly on Europe and Germany. Uh, and then Isabel will talk uh, about her uh, very uh, hands-on experience with artificial intelligence. Uh, and then I think uh, you guys will open for questions. So we'll be here for you and can't wait for that interaction. Now, you can see my slides, right? Okay. Uh, so what I would like to uh, start with, as you see on this image, is that Europe, I made Europe bigger than the other pictures on purpose, right? Uh, because in a way, Europe has a great opportunity to match the development uh, along with USA and China. But we need to ramp up the efforts. And most importantly, we have to activate a new mindset in order to be successful in artificial intelligence, a mindset that allows for innovation without fear. And I call it humanize. Uh, the human should be at the center You've heard this many times, but I want to show you a little bit on how to think about artificial intelligence in the new normal world, because this world is changing. Um, you know, you, we can debate how much the post-COVID world will really change our day-to-day -day habits, but clearly it's gonna change our mindsets. And clearly we're gonna talk about how to make new processes more digital than what we've had before. And that's basically what artificial intelligence can support. So we've heard this headline of the global AI race a lot over the next, last few years. So the question for me was really, is there a race in AI and should there be one? And I think we have split views on this one because you will see on one side, there are some alarmists that are claiming that Europe is losing this race to the US and China. Then other people think it can't and shouldn't be a race because artificial intelligence has no end. It continually evolves. And as we know, it started in the fifties. It's nothing new. And it is evolving and we are very much at the very beginning of it. And you'll see this in the examples we're gonna show you. Uh, but even if it was a race, it would be the wrong race to run. So my point of view is there is no such thing as a race in the development of AI. Um, this rhetoric is actually wrong and, it, it, and it's dangerous as well. So the goal is not to win races here, but to ensure human well-being by using this technology for the greater good. And as you can see in these numbers, according to research by PwC and McKinsey, AI could contribute up to $15.7 trillion to the global economy in 2030. That is more than the current output of China and India combined, which represents about 3 billion people, which is the half of this world. And all regions of the global economy will experience benefits from AI. That is very clear. North America and China will probably see the biggest economic gains. You see on their numbers here with about $10 trillion which will represent about 70% of the global economic impact. Now, Europe and developed Asia will also see significant economic gains from AI, which is gonna enhance their GDP. And 
in a way, you can see that developing countries will experience more modest increases due to the lower rates of adoption uh, on these technologies, while the developing, uh, while the front runners will have uh, clearly three characteristics. And that's what we want to really be careful that Europe stays on top of these three characteristics on how to really be a leader in this space. Number one is we need a strong digital base. This whole debate around the tracing app for COVID is exactly the, uh, uh, what we shouldn't do, especially in Germany. Uh, and we did a um, podcast just uh, two weeks ago with Lithuania, with a staff from Lithuania called Telesoftas, who worked together with the government to very quickly come up with a very decentralized, anonymous way of tracing potential COVID um, infections. And so we truly need that strong digital base across the board in all Europe. Number two, the winners will have a higher propensity to invest in AI. So we need to remove the risks and the fears and really start investing big time. And number three, we need positive views. We need positive understanding and views of this business case for the technology. It's not any science fiction. It, it should be based on business value that this technology brings. And so in this new era, it is all about collaboration and co-creation. That's why you see we are developers, we see women in AI, and you see Miss AI and Humanize collaborate together. In a way, we actually do similar things, but we collaborate and we co-create for the greater good. So for Europe, it is not so much a question of winning or losing a race, but really of finding a way of embracing the opportunities offered by AI in a way that is human-centered, that is ethical, that is secure and true to our core values. That's the unique value proposition in Europe. And so people in Europe love their sophisticated lifestyle and strong family lives. I used to live in the United States and in many countries across Europe. Uh, I can tell I want to live here in Europe today and, and really uh, be part of this development. Innovation today happens in cities like Lisbon, Vilnius, Belgrade, Bucharest, Barcelona, Warsaw, just to name a few. So there is a lot going on in Europe today. Now, if we look at Europe more in depth, there are a couple of the strongest AI unicorns, such as Spotify from Sweden, which actually exists since 14 years. Uh, and in Germany, Zalando, exists since 12 years, and they have a combined market value of around $42 billion. If you look at Alibaba, because they are serving a market of 1.3 trillion people, they are worth more than 10 times more, which is $480 billion. And Facebook is worth $550 billion, I think the last time I looked at the numbers. Uh, but they also are serving more than 2 billion users just in their countries, right? Uh, and while Zalando has about 24 million users and Spotify has about 200 million users. So I want to make sure we put it all into perspective. The way we have seen people dealing with the statistics around COVID was teaching us a very important lesson, which is let's look at the numbers into the bigger scheme of things, put them into perspective, make sure we truly understand those numbers. And it's more important to understand the insights and not the raw numbers. Okay, so now very quickly here, you can see London is the center of Europe's tech sector. Uh, they are producing about 21% of the unicorns. You can see about 36 unicorns, which are worth um, over $130 billion. Berlin, where I'm living and from where I'm speaking right now, uh, has produced eight unicorns. Uh, how is that? How can we change that? Uh, and they are worth just $32 billion. But then again, compare these two cities' population, we have 3 million people, 3.4 million people in, in Berlin only compared to London, which is three times, I think, two and a half times bigger. So within the EU, the largest economies who have the most AI players will still be the UK, who has about 25% of the European AI players and 6% of the worldwide ones. Germany has about 15% of the EU AI players and 4% of worldwide, and France has about 11% of the EU, uh, and that makes 3% of worldwide. So combined, 
these three countries have about 50% of European AI players, and that represents about 13 of the worldwide players. Now, this is a lot of numbers, but why is that important? Because the German companies need to really ramp up. They have a lot more potential and they, they, they are going to ramp up as well. So in a way, as you look at these countries, um, you basically see that the base of uh, the modern AI was put in Europe. Let's be very clear, these three pictures you see on the right side of this slide, you can see automatic computing, pattern recognition, the transistor, the general purpose computer, all of these have been created in Europe. Um, and as you can see, according to The Economist, German companies had more patents on autonomous vehicles in 2018 than Chinese and Americans together. Uh, now, if you look at the three key digital technologies that were created in Europe, uh, you see uh, that, for example, the very first driverless car, the first picture up there, was called Prometheus, was made by Mercedes um, and designed by Ernst Dickmann in Munich in the 80s at the Bundeswehr University in Munich. And so it was driving 180 kilometers an hour on autobahns in 1995, driverless. Deep learning was created by the French researcher Ian Lecon in uh, 1983. Now he works and lives in the US, but he's a French guy. And the English scientist Tim Berners-Lee, who created the World Wide Web in 89 and wrote the first web browser in 1990, 30 years ago, while he was employed at CERN in Geneva. So my point is there is a lot of power already in Europe. Uh, the adoption rate here, as you can see, uh, there is a lot of uh, going on in the robot process automation, a lot going on in machine learning. Uh, and as you can see, even autonomous vehicles is now developing a little bit faster. Now, if you look at, this is in German, but I will very quickly translate for you. In 1929, uh, in 2019, sorry, uh, last year, Artificial intelligence uh, was its stake in Germany with a turnover of around 221 billion euros, of which 45 billion euros was in automobile production alone. And you'll see more from Isabel on the real life, um, what, what people are doing in many areas. Consumer goods even represented 26 billion. And if you look at the very last one on the chart, even media, the media sector, radio, uh, had a, an impact of 6.5 billion. So clearly AI pays off and um, you see the investments here, which country gets most investment. It's really interesting to see that in uh, about three years ago, 2018, uh, we had $273 million um, and, and then it's really got growing uh, steadily every year. Uh, and in Germany, we saw that we had 218 new startups funded last year. So that is why Germany has uh, a great potential, but it's still behind uh, Great Britain and behind France. Uh, and also in terms of its, its investment, Germany is not getting enough investment. So this is a big call, which I'm not the first one, not the only one and not the last one to say we absolutely need to increase investment value, volume in Germany. But we also should look at the fact that it doubled compared to 2018. Uh, you see here a few of the key cities in Germany. We have about 102 AI startups in Berlin. And then in Munich, we have 50. And in Hamburg, we have 17. These are the big clusters in Germany. About 30% of these AI startups are focusing on all industries. And uh, um, uh, about 1.2 billion were invested by VCs and uh, M&As, merchant acquisitions. Uh, it's still a small number, but I want you to, uh, to see that there is big potential and also there is a uh, big potential in terms of sales, pot uh, sales potential out of this market. Uh, now I'd like to give you a quick taste of some of the most successful AI startups in Germany. This slide shows a lot of them, but I put a couple of arrows you can see uh, on the chatbot and customer interaction, on the cross-industry consulting, um, and also on the infotainment. Um, I want to give you just three examples today. Um, one is Parlamind, which is an AI for customer service representatives. So they are using the latest uh, research results in uh, natural language processes and machine learning to analyze incoming customer communication. And then they manage uh, and answer independently. So that, that um, chatbot is basically managing uh, the answers uh, independently. And that means this AI 
AI works very well integrated with their human colleagues, just as another member of the customer service team. They have great experience with that. Look into that if you want to know more. Um, there is Tony, which is a T A W N Y. Uh, it's what we call, uh, what they call emotion AI. It is a system in which intelligent things adapt to human emotion in order to be more efficient to be more healthy and safer. And uh, this is a huge potential also for the retail space. Um, and finally, Niris um, is uh, basically a search engine that finds products and objects in images and videos in less than a second. So it's hugely, uh, really quick. And uh, it's a visual search engine that aggregates top-notch algorithms with this incredible matching speed, speed and quality just three very diverse solutions. Um, and I, I want to show you that when we speak about AI, uh, we spark these new ideas and thinking. Uh, but what else do we need to have to be leading in AI? And uh, as we started this talk, I was speaking about mindset. Uh, we conducted a research study last year to find out exactly what, what is needed to make sense of AI in this world. And it's probably more needed now than ever before. And uh, we asked our Miss AI members and, and uh, you know, our ambassadors, um, and I was really very impressed by the level of input we've gotten and the five trends that emerged. Uh, and these five elements are number one, optimism, particularly now when there is a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear also about what's coming, what this virus is doing with us, how long, when, and as we said about the numbers, what really, what should we trust today? So optimism means we need to believe we will be the winners in this whole situation because humanity and history shows that is the case. But in particular for artificial intelligence, Europe is not a loser. We need to speak more about our AI results uh, versus the process. It's not the process, not just the ethics, it's not just you know research, it's really about what are the results. And I showed you just a few of them, Isabel will show you more. Um, courage is to take risks, to change, to stop getting intimidated by, by the technology, by others, uh, and really ask, how do I want to change the world of AI today? Because it really comes down to every single one of us. We are making the future. And because progress is not linear, it starts right here, right now. Um, the third element that came out is ambition. Uh, the ambition to develop our own unique, local, first of all, local here, right now, unique selling propositions and capabilities for AI. So how do we create the infrastructure for the free flow of data? How do we generate and enhance investment and public funding? How do we develop a meaningful digital ecosystem based on European values? And how do we show these European AI use cases to the world? And I know those of you that are involved with the European Union in Brussels, they have amazing programs and are doing a lot and investing billions just in this area. And number four is trust. Nothing can happen in this world uh, between human beings, but in particular between technology and human beings, if we do not have trust. How do we generate trust? It's very simple. We need to educate the entire population on the AI benefits and shortcomings, the limitations, the opportunities and challenges, we need to show both sides of the coin and we need to create innovative ways of regulating and scaling down outdated rules that inhibit innovation. And we have plenty of those. And finally, it's really about speed. So let me pause here for a second. It's about being fast now. If this is urgent, we need to be thoughtful, but we really need to activate politics, businesses, nonprofits, education sector, researchers, all together to collaborate to create our solutions quickly. And while the technology is progressing rapidly, we know that the diversity of those designing the algorithms is not yet there. And maybe that's why you have two women here speaking on behalf of diversity and inclusion. Um, I want to tell you 22% of the um, ITC professionals globally, 22% are female, uh, less than 5% are female in AI. 
that is limiting our innovative capacity. So what I'm saying is it's not about gender diversity, it's about all sorts of diversity. And we need men and women together in high tech and in business, not just men pushing for men or men pushing for women or women pushing for women. We need humans propelling that talent. And we do not want our future to be built only by one type of, let's say, engineers. To create that balanced world, we need all disciplines to collaborate. We need philosophers because there's an ethics question. We need neuroscientists because we need to understand the brain in order to make artificial brains. We need sociologists who look at the impact on the society. We need anthropologists who are looking at it from a cultural perspective. So we need all these people to collaborate, which is not an easy task, to ask the right questions in order to shape AI in a way that is useful to all. And so AI is both a gift and a responsibility. And so what we need for my part is I feel really accountable um, that we are here to help companies and people understand AI, how to use it and how to make it more transparent, more inclusive, more diverse and more accountable. These are very key. And how to, that's a very, very big question. So now the question is, is Europe investing enough? Is Germany investing enough? The answer is no. Will all European Union countries or European countries have a strong AI strategy soon? Probably, but still no. The Corona times showed us clearly we have a lot more to do. So how do we want to split this in order to speak about future potential and, and solutions. And so the future really belongs, especially in tech, belongs to the end user. That's something that Europe has understood. Uh, and I know if you are in this room, you are the future, you are the role models, you have the power to build a world we all want to live in. And we have the power to make some reasonable changes. Now it is our job to go out there and bring all of this to everyone because AI is for everyone. And really, Leonardo da Vinci was right. It's not just being willing, we need to do. No. So I want to leave you with this before I pass uh, to, uh, oh, to Isabel. Uh, if you want to know more, join our Friday Facts, join our Humanize too. Tour. I also uh, just published a book that's called the Proust Questionnaire, which is uh, 22 AI questions asked uh, to 22 very diverse AI experts. Um, and with that, I would like to just uh, give over to Isabel. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Let's start. Second. So, Nancy, thank you very much. This is a great foundation later on for the Q&A session, especially like how does it change the speed before Corona and after, why it's important that we really invest and in focus in AI solutions. But before we go into those details, I want to give you a deeper insight, like where I do come from and what kind of solution we offer and with how do you, how we deal with certain challenges and i'm also looking forward to deeper discussions later on so today i will speak how to what kind of software we developed it's a b2b software and the unique point is that we do not only use data as an important source of information but also engineering knowledge and how we create added value for our customers maybe a few words about myself. I'm from, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. Um, during my PhD, I started looking deeper into machine learning, specifically into Bayesian inference. Um, I worked for different companies and also give lectures and workshop for those. And besides this, I live in Munich in Bavaria and I love swimming, hiking, sailing and being outdoor. 
So I want to give you a first overview. I know most of you are familiar with this, but for those who are, who are coming more from a business point of view, AI is often a bit confusing. There are many AI suppliers, which leads to an transparent picture. And um, also people do not really know what kind of solution they should include in their business. And one key point for our customers to find the right use cases and the right solutions for their setup. And most of you are probably familiar with state of the art AI solution, specifically in the area of text, speech and picture recognition. There are many well-known use cases. Nancy already mentioned a few ones. And there are also a few ones in the production process optimization. And today I want to leave this area of state-of-the-art AI solution and show you a, a different approach and why this is interesting for specific use cases. Because the standard AI algorithms, which are available, uh, need a lot of data. And in certain use cases, you have a lot of data. For example, um, if you have millions of cats, cat picture, or you have millions of um, speech and images. However, if you go into the manufacturing industry, and for example, being in Germany, you produce cars, you don't want to collect the data of millions of cars to learn how your manufacturing process change, but you want to learn this with much fewer data points. And um, those manufacturing um, processes are really complex. So humans have the difficulties, and coming from engineer, I can tell you that this is really the case, um, have the difficulties to know how, what is the optimal setup for, for the manufacturing processes. Um, and the challenge is that the optimal setup changes over time. And if you come from engineering, you may know it, but from people outside, it's often surprising that there, that there is a massive acceleration potential in the manufacturing industry. So we have often 20, 10 to 20% rejects of and bad quality products. Um, we have long ramp up time for new products, and there's still a lot of um, improvements available. However, we don't have the large amount of data. How do we deal with this? We say, besides the data, there's another important source of information. And this is domain knowledge. Um, by this, we mean coming from engineering, you, know, you may know that if the temperature is really high, you need a fewer time to dry a surface. Or you know from experience that if you throw a ball up in the air, that by gravity it will return to Earth. And using this knowledge, and we do it in a standard automated way, we already train our algorithm. This means we use knowledge which is available, transform this in mathematical equation, including probability theory, for those who are familiar, especially with Bayesian inference, and then add available data. And with this available data, we learn the scenario which is not known beforehand. And after we have done uh, the training, similar to, to, to the approaches you may be familiar, you can now use the algorithm to predict and also to recommend certain setups. So this is, we are dealing in the area of prediction and prescription. So this is a quite technical slide for a, a lot of information, it, but the, the, the unique part is here that we explicitly include expert knowledge, formalize it and combine this with available data. A few of one who are interested in details, it's um, developed by ourselves. It's based on Bayesian statistics. Um, and if you're interested, I'm happy to discuss with you more details after the presentation. We have a, a product um, on, on premise and also as a web application. 
um, but I promise to show you some use cases, some real time use cases. And I want to start with a really complex industry application. It's painting plastic part. And painting plastic part, for example, for your car is quite complex. And you have a lot of reasons why you don't have a perfect quality at the end. Um, typical types of errors are that we have pine paint strikes or paint blisters um, or that the color is not the perfect, has not perfect fidelity and you do not want that the front part of your car looks slightly different than um, the side part. So the color needs to be like in the, in the, in the same, um, have this exactly same color or you have uh, incomplete coverage. And based on this, and because um, especially in Germany, you have really high quality standards, more than 10% of your um, painted parts are rejects. And this is one of the use cases where the production line is really complex, the production is really sensitive, and the optimal conditions are not constant. Because depending what kind of color you use, what, how, what the surrounding temperature is, what kind of product you paint, the optimal conditions change. And for those who, who are coming from, from, from business may already calculate what the optimization potential is. If I say uh, the number of rejects is more than 10% and how much you pay for your parts of your cars, you can imagine how, how much money you waste by this high number of rejects. And what do we do here? We include expert knowledge the engineers know. As an example, they know the ideal temperature of a cabin should be in a certain range. Or they may say, um, if, the, if the paint you get from your supplier is really thick, you need more solvent to, to spray it homogeneously. We include this once in a standardized way and then the algorithm is trained. And how, what can you do with such a pre-trained algorithm? You can use this to predict what the outcome of your production is at the end of your production line and also calculate optimal input parameters in the area of prescription. How does it look like? Um, in this setup here, we have 25% rejects as a standard average. If we get the first data from the paint and the raw part, our product calculates the new probability that we have rejects at the end and says, if we readjust some parameters in the primer where they paint the first layer, um, it will improve the probability that we have a part which is not okay. And this continuously calculates certain probabilities and suggest how should they readjust parameters in real time to at the end get to a higher probability good outcomes. And this is like a really complex scenario, but there are many other use cases which are really interesting. For example, in the area of R&D, you do not want to build hundreds of thousands of prototypes to learn how should a new product look like. And because this is quite time consuming, consuming and costs a lot of money. Imagine that you include the knowledge of your customers from previous products and only have very few prototypes to learn new behavior and accelerate your R&D process. So we did a project in, in, in this area and uh, if I have more time, I'm happy to tell you more about this. So R&D is also a really interesting area. I gave you already an example in the area of production with painting plastic parts. And another use case is more in the area of machine learning is, is that if you produce a product for an end customer, for example, a robot, you want that the end customer get support how to readjust his robot um, based on changing surrounding conditions. So if you have an AI solution, which learns how it should be readjusted, the end customers can 
produce much um, faster, more precise, um, using less material consumption. So this is also really interesting to do things in this area. And this is how we set up use cases before Corona. And we can discuss later on in the Q&A sessions, how does it change? So in the past, um, uh, we had three steps, um, how to lead our customers to include AI products. The first one is a really simple um, project called Proof of Value, where we show with very few data and very limited expert knowledge, uh, what can we predict with our software algorithm? Um, after this, we lead the discussion for the proof of concept, like what is the IT infrastructure um, we need? This depends from customer to customer. What kind of additional data do we need um, to really um, make the model more precise? And after we have done this, we have a good foundation to include our um, AI product. Um, so this helped us to really lead customers to do their first steps using AI products and include it in their production, in their R&D process, or also in their products. So coming to an end, I want to mention, because it's uh, important for our network, that in case you're looking uh, for a data science job in Bavaria, I have a friend uh, with a relatively young startup um, who's looking for someone. So in case you're interested, um, get in touch with me and I will give you an introduction. And secondly, um, if you're German speaking, I know this is a quite hard requirement and not really fair, but if you're German speaking and you have a lot of experiences in AI on premise embedded or, or on cloud, I'm looking for um, a partner to give workshops and consultancies. And this is something related to Corona because I quite get a few requests nowadays from CEOs and Aufsichtsräte who wants to know, learn how to include AI in their products to really push forward the German economy and make it um, much more attractive also in the future. And because I get quite a few requests nowadays in the Corona times, it seems that those people are not traveling that much any longer and wants to use this time wisely. I'm looking for partners who are interested to give high quality workshops and consultancy things. Um, so if you have interested in those, I'm also happy to contact. And at this, I want to thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward to discuss with you and Nancy your questions. Thank you.